I'm just going to think this is just another piece of junk I've collected through the years. <laughs> to be honest, I have collected a lot of crap. But you know, this key, there's a story. It's April break. I'm staying at a wonderful cottage on Cape Cod. I stay there every year, and one of the reasons I love to go is because it's so removed that I can stay there and I can leave the cottage unlocked and my car unlocked the entire week. So I even leave the keys in the admission. It makes me feel, you know, like I'm in a safer area. You know, simpler time. So one morning I decided to get out and go to the beach. And I get up and I get my wallet and my cell phone and I head out to the car. And I'm doing the old, you know, wallet, cell phone, keys check. Oh, where's the, oh, the keys are in the car. That makes me happy. Out to the car I go. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. I get to the car. There's no keys. They're not in the ignition. They're not on the floor. They're not in a little compartment between the seats. Oh, by force I have it probably yesterday when I got out of the car. I put them in my pants. So I go back. I look at the pants I wore yesterday. There's no keys. And then I look on the dresser, and there are my keys. They've been there right next to the cell phone and the wallet the entire time. So I get the keys, I head up to the car. I'm thinking to myself, now why didn't I see these keys? And the only reason I can think of is because I had decided ahead of time that they weren't there. <laughs> you know? Maybe think, how many things in any given day don't I see because I had decided ahead of time they're not there. So. This isn't just a key, it's a story. Mm -hmm. See all this junk, all this stuff? They're all stories. They're stories of events in my life, people I've met. You know, recently I moved my 99-year-old mother from assisted living to full-time care. In the process, we had to take all of her belongings and, you know, distribute what goes to family members, what goes into storage at my place, what goes to goodwill. Mm -hmm. As I'm looking through a lot of her stuff, I'm thinking, geez, this is just a lot of junk, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, but not to her. No, no, no. Every single thing is a story. And doesn't she love to tell those stories? Yeah. Some of them are sweet. Some are sad. Some are hilarious. And some, well, to be honest, they're just downright boring. <laughs> but you know, 99 years, not every story is going to keep you on the edge of your seat. Anyway, here's the thing. My kids, all four of them, are coming to visit me next week because they want to see their granny. So I'm looking around at all my stuff, and I'm wondering, what stories do they know? What stories am I leaving for my kids? Like these cat tales. So I'm an artist. I work in steel. And I used to collect, you know, steel uh, railroad spikes. I never knew what I was going to do with them, but I would just collect them. Well, until one day I was walking over that causeway at Scarborough Beach over the ponds, and I'm looking out at all the cattails, and I went, oh, oh, cattails, railroad spikes. Hmm, works for me. But there's another story here. I was living in Portland back in the 90s. I was living on the third floor of this apartment on Spring Street. It was the top floor. And I come home one day. And I'm walking up the stairs, and I'm going from the first floor up to the second floor, and there's a landing in between. And as I go up to the landing, I see the tail of a cat going around the corner. I don't think much about it, except that we don't have a cat on our end of the building. <laughs> so, you know, I go up from the second floor to the third floor. I see, there again is the tail of the cat. Only this time, I realize, it's not a cattail. It's long, it's skinny, and it's shiny. It's the tail of a rat. So I go around the corner, coming up to the third floor, fully expecting to find the rat at the top of the stairs. But there's no rat. Now, there's only two doors up there, my door to my apartment and my neighbor's. And I know I have a little tiny crack under my door, but no rat can get in there, right? But there's no crack under my neighbor's door. The rat is in my apartment. <laughs> so I go in, I open the door, I look in my living room, no rat. I look in the bedroom, no rat. No rat in the closet. I look in the bathroom, the only place left is a kitchen. I go in, I look, I look under the table, no rat. I look behind the refrigerator, nothing. Until I come to the stove. 
<laughs> and there, coming out from the back of the stove along the left side, is this long, nasty tail. And it's one of those apartment-sized stoves, you know, just two, two and a half feet wide. Mm -hmm. So I peer over the stove, and there's that rat. It is the full length of this stuff, you know, the stove. <laughs> so I run to my bedroom. I, have, I use my bedroom as my studio, so I also have a piece of plywood. I bring it over, and I shove it against the frame of the door. Luckily, my phone's nearby, and I call my landlord, Scott. I want to tell him I got a rat in the apartment. Yeah, what do you want me to do about it? <laughs> well, why don't you come get rid of the rat? Why can't you do that? <laughs> no, no, absolutely, I do not do rats. Ugh, he groans. Look, it's your building, it's your rat. Ah, uh, he says, all right, I'll come over. Well, he lives just around the corner, so about five minutes later, there's a knock on the door. I tell him to come in. He's got a red ski pole with him. It's mine. He got it down in the basement in the storage room. <laughs> he comes in, I move the plywood, tell him where it is, he goes in, he goes right up to the stove, looks back, shakes it like that. The rat comes running out of the stove, sees Scott, turns, runs towards me, sees the plywood, leaps in the air, ricochets off, Scott skewers him midair, oh, the rat was dead instantly. Tiny pool of blood. Where guys like Scott get that kind of testosterone? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he makes to leave, and I go, ooh, 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 no, take your rat, <laughs> So he grimaces, but he takes the rat. I clean up. A couple days later, I go downstairs to do laundry in the basement, and I look in the storage room. He's never returned my ski pole. <laughs> and I think to myself, I need to call him, and then I thought, hell no. Now he's got that ski pole, and he's got a great story to go with it. Just like I got my story. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, it's odd, though. In both these instances, I was wrong. You know, I didn't see the key, because I had decided ahead of time it wasn't there. I saw a cat tail. Let's face it, I did not want to see a rat tail. So in both situations, my perception altered my reality. You know, maybe those are the kind of stories I need to be telling my kids. Like this. It was December. I was visiting a friend down in uh, New Orleans not long after Katrina. And I was taking a long walk, and I was going along the bar, uh, in the Marigny district, not far from uh, French Quarter. And I'm walking down the street, and I see this hand lettered sign on a telephone pole that said, Think you might be wrong. You know, I'm a little taken aback by this at first, and then I realized, you know, the author isn't telling me I am wrong, just asking me to think I might be wrong. I can get on board with that. So I began to think about that. Little things, big things, you know. Well, as a matter of fact, when I head off to work uh, on Monday, I come back to Maine, I was teaching up in Raymond at the time. So I'm driving along, and I'm on the old Egypt Road. At least I think I'm on the Egypt Road. <coughs> until I see this house I've never seen before. Huh. Well, you know how it is. You get on autopilot. You're driving somewhere over and over and over again. So I think, oh, I might have just missed my turn. So now, for the next several miles, I'm looking at every house and every turn, you know, closer than I ever... Yeah, I've never seen that house. Huh, there's another one I've never seen. And then there was a horse stable, a barn, that I had never seen. I thought, I have got to be on the wrong road. But then I came to a hill and a curb, and it felt, you know, vaguely familiar. I go up over the hill, and then I see a house I know, and another, and in about a minute, I was at school. It turns out I'd been on the Egypt Road the entire time. But the fact that I had thought I might be wrong. You know, it resulted in me seeing things that I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw the world with brand new eyes. It's kind of, kind of like this. I call this my bag of happiness. It comes from a Suki tale. It goes something like this. There was this young man. He was walking down an old country road. Up ahead, he sees this old man. The old man is crying and weeping and cursing, and he's kicking this small black canvas bag. Oh, man, what's wrong? What makes you so unhappy? I lost my wife, my business, my family. I lost everything. The only things I have left are the few trinkets I can put into this small canvas bag. The mere sight of it makes me just angry. The young man reaches down, grabs the bag, and runs down the road and up over a hill. Oh, this, this is horrible! Now I don't even have my few memories! I hate life! Says the old man as he stumbles down the road and up and over the hill. But there, on the other side of the hill, in the middle of the road, 
such a small flat canvas bag. Nothing missing. Oh, this is wonderful! Thank you, thank you, Dad! Oh, I'm so happy! Meanwhile, in the bushes, the young man scratched his head. How can the same bag, which made him so unhappy on one side of the hill, make him so happy on the other? The bag hadn't changed. Perceptions. 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 Ah, the people of the sky. If ever there was a story about how perceptions can lead us astray. You know, I wrote this several years back, and I know I've given a copy to my kids. But I wonder, do they really get it, or do they think that it's just a kid's tale? <laughs> I has all but forgotten that once there lived a spectacularly clever people known as the people of the sky. The people of the sky love the sky. They love that it went on forever and ever. They loved that it constantly changed. Why, one minute they'd look up, it would be a bright blue. They'd get about their business. Next time they looked up, it might be yellows or oranges. Sometimes it might be bright clouds. It might be the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars. The people love the ever-changing face of sky. What's more, when the wind blew, the people thought that was the voice of sky speaking to them. And when it caressed their skin, that was sky reaching out to touch them. And so thus, they loved the wind, the sky, and the trees. So much so that they had celebrations to honor all of them. Now the people of the sky, they were simple people. They lived very closely attuned to nature, but they were not simpletons. Now you see, the people of the sky were very clever. They were the first people to realize that the earth was not the center of the universe. That indeed, the earth rotated around its own axis as it revolved around the sun. And it was a tilt of that axis that resulted in the seasons. Thus, being clever people, they took this knowledge of the spinning boost of the earth, and they designed spinning machines to make their life easier. They were the first people to learn how to spin clay in the way they could make molds. They learned how to spin wool to make yarn. They began to spin, you know, water in ways that could lift it up into their fields and water their crops. They spun great giant wheels to grind their grains. And over time, their machines got bigger and bigger and bigger. And as they did, they began to power them with steam. Of course, to have steam, you need to have fire. To have fire, they had to have wood. To have wood, they had to cut down some of those beautiful trees that they loved. And each of the fires pumped smoke up into the air, made it more difficult to see sky. And each machine made noise and made it a little more difficult to hear. But you know the benefit of these machines. They figured it far outweighed the problems. So on and on and on they went make more and more of their spinning machines until finally, over time, the people of the sky became known as the spinners. Now there's more to the story, and I will tell it, but their cleverness makes me think of a tale that I need to tell my kids, and it's not a very pleasant one. There's a quote that's attributed to Mark Twain. It says, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. <laughs> Think about that. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Well, here's something ironic. There's no record of Mark Twain ever speaking or writing the word. <laughs> Anyone who attributes to Mark Twain is wrong. <laughs> kind of ironic, right? You gotta love irony. But here's the thing. I need to tell my kids about the irony that can exist in the relationship that we have with the things that we firmly believe. This is not an easy tale to tell. It's difficult, I'm ashamed of what I'm about to tell you, but I need to tell my kids. A little background. It was 1971. I had witnessed the you know, assassination of John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr. The, the civil rights unrest, the war in Vietnam, the war on poverty, the total turmoil in our culture just I, confused me so much, I just could not make sense of any of it. And so I dropped out of school trying to find some answers. In short order, 
I was submerged in the teachings of the Way International. The Way offered answers. Answers for everything. War, hate, abortion. God's Word says. <laughs> yeah, homosexuality, homelessness. The Bible says. It gave us solid ground to stand on. Truth to base our life on. And to be honest, I enjoyed a peace I had never known. Why not? I didn't have to think or feel deeply about anything anymore. I had the answers. Uh, you know, looking back, I realized I was so hungry for answers, I was willing to give up reason to have them. So, it was a sunny summer Sunday in the other Portland, 1980, and there were seven of us living in a fellowship home. My wife Robin, myself, our two oldest kids, two friends who moved out from North Carolina, and uh, Cindy, who was a missionary with the way. She'd been assigned to live with us. So all the local fellowships had gathered together to have a picnic that day. So at some point, Robin brings this couple, Liam and Leah, over to the table. Liam and Leah were from New York City. They were a Jewish couple who were riding across the country on their motorcycle, and they were camping as they went. And they were keeping a journal of all of their experiences and the people they met. Well, as they approached the table, I could see that Liam was limping a little bit. Anyway, they came over, we talked, we had a good time. We did our usual witnessing thing, talking about God's love and the abundance he wanted for their lives. I mentioned, you know, healing was available. I actually offered to lay out hands for healing and prayer. Liam wasn't ready to go there. It was all right. Anyway, at some point, my wife found out that they had not yet found a place to camp. So she offered them our backyard. You know, they liked that. When I found out about it, I thought, that's a great idea. So pretty soon, we all head off back to the house. Everyone except Cindy. Cindy has been invited, she said, to have dinner with Reverend Stacy. Now, Reverend Stacy was the man of God of all the local fellowships. Now, male or female, we always refer to them as man of God. So we head on. Liam and Leah set their tent in the backyard. We were sitting around the table. We've had dinner. We're just laughing. We're talking. We're having such a good time. They, you know, they, it was apparent they weren't going to convert from, you know, to, from Judaism to Christianity, but who cares? They were great people, and they were telling great stories of their adventures, and they were enjoying ours. Now, at some point during dinner, the weather changed dramatically, and it started to pour. Now, we offered, would they like to set their, you know, bring their uh, sleeping bags inside? They said no, they'd sleep in their tent. So, you know, we're sitting around, we're laughing, talking, and all of a sudden, the door burst open, and in walks Cindy. Her hair is soaking wet. Reverend Stacy wants to see you. What? She's outside. Okay. So I head outside. And there's Reverend Stacy. She's sitting at the end, she's at the end of the driveway. She's got on a raincoat. I got a short sleeve shirt and pair of shorts. It's raining. It's, it's just cold. It's awful. She won't come inside this drive. She won't offer to sit in the car. No, she just sits there telling me that Cindy informed her that my wife had invited unbelievers into my home. She then continues saying, you know, don't you realize that your woman has usurped your authority as the man of God of your household? And further, she says, don't you realize the danger you put your children in by leaving these unbelievers and bringing them into your house? I'm trying to think about the verses about God's love, about the kindness of Jesus to strangers. She continues, you need to tell them to leave right now. Then she turns to go to her car, and then she calls back. And then, you need to tell your woman you got to put her in her place. Now, for some of you, that's hard to hear, but it's really hard to say. Well, I head back to the house. I don't know how I'm going to do this. These are good people, and Liam is hurting. You know, it's Sunday night. It's raining. It's dark. It's cold. They, they don't know another soul in the city. It's, there's no Google, there's no cell phones. They've got no place to go. But the man of God has spoken. So I head to the house. I can see they're laughing around the table about something. I come in, my shoes are squishy with water. I must have looked a horror. I looked at Liam and Leah. I'm sorry, but you need to pack your things and go. The look a shock and horror on their faces still embedded in my heart today. And Leah put all this talk about a loving God. How can this be a loving thing to do? I feel exactly the same way. 
But if I'm going to make sense of this, if I'm going to continue to believe in the teachings of the way, which I have to because I've built my life on this thing, and if I don't, my world will come crashing down. I have to find a way. Besides, the man of God had said, so take a breath. Now look at Liam and Leah. If the man of God tells us to do this, we are to do it. We have to trust that a loving God would never ask us to do something that wasn't the best for us, for you as well as for us. Therefore, as awful as this seems, it must be the most loving thing to do. I said those words. It's how I justified the horrible actions and words of that day. In silence, Liam and Leah get up. They head out the door towards, into the torrential rain, Liam limping as they go. I ask one of our housemates to watch the kids while Rob and I go out for a bit. So cut to an hour later. We're sitting in a cafe. It's still pouring. It's dark. I've just read her the riot act for being an unfaithful wife. I don't believe a word I'm saying. She doesn't either. It's horrible. It's just a horrible situation. When unbelievably, who comes by our window but Liam and Leah pushing their motorcycle in the pouring rain. Liam limping as he goes. To make matters worse, the bike either was out of gas or in need of repairs. Oh, I suck at ass. But that's how I justified my words and actions that night. I had to, or my world would have come crashing down. I wasn't willing to think I might be wrong, even though I knew in my heart that I was. Oh, and somewhere out there, there's a journal. And in, in that journal, there's an entry about a Christian couple who invited Leah and Liam into their home and threw them out into the cold, dark, rainy night. And let me tell you, I deserve that entry to be written about me. So I keep this journal, this empty journal, because I wish I could go back. I wish I could erase the things I didn't say that day. But I can't. And sadly, I need to tell my kids about a time that I did such a horrible thing in the name of love. Uh, you know, our beliefs, our perceptions, they play a huge role in our lives. I grew up this, with this perception that I was supposed to be someone, do something important, you know, as if I had to justify my existence, prove my self-worth. Does a tree try to justify its existence? Do the birds, do the dogs, the trees, the flowers, anything? Does the ocean try to fret over its purpose? We can get so busy trying to rush to this life we think we're supposed to be living that if we're not careful, we can run right through the life we have. We live on this island, floating in space. Look at the stuff that we've done to the place. All for the sake of trying to win some race that goes on and on and on. It's one for the money and it's two for the show. Three to get ready, and it's four to go. Where are we going now? Well, nobody knows. But it goes on, and on, and on. I used to know so much about life without end. I was so clever, thought I had seen round the band. Shocked me something to find I was just human And it goes on 
and on and on. So where are we running now and why so fast? Afraid if we spend it that our time won't last. Now is all the time we have to pass, but it goes on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> this is one of my aliens. Yep. Uh, you've seen them here and there. You know, I usually make them five or six feet tall and they stand outside. Uh, you know, the thing is, someone was elected president a while back, and when I woke up that morning, I realized that I felt like an alien in my old man. <laughs> so I started making these. <laughs> but my kids, yeah, but my kids know that story. Oh, <laughs> this one, oh my God, i got to tell them this, Dale. got to tell them this. You know, years ago, I met one of the most interesting people I have ever met, Merle. Merle was living in a dumpster when I first met him. It was Cincinnati, it was warm spring day, and for a guy who was living in a dumpster, he walked down the street like he owned the place. He had on this old overcoat with no buttons, had blue jeans were torn at the knees, these uh, black cowboy boots were all scuffed up, silver tips. You know, all scraped up. But he walked out with a big bounce in his step, you know, smile on his face, light his eyes like he was in some secret of the universe. He walked right up to me. Ah, my name's Merle! You believe in dinosaurs? <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> Do I believe in dinosaurs? <laughs> well, yeah, Merle, I believe in dinosaurs. You know, they're extinct. Oh, I see, they're extinct, huh? Who told you that? Huh? 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 Who told you that? I'll tell you who told you that. Them flatheads told you that. That's right, flatheads. Yeah, they're the same people told you not that long ago that the earth was flat. Flat as a pancake. We said, oh yeah, they had charts and maps and graphs. They had a model of a flat world, earth. That's right. You just remember these flatheads, these scientists that tell you that the dinosaurs are extinct are the same one that says one time that the earth was flat. <laughs> oh, and what? Proof do they give you? Huh? I'll tell you what proof they give you. They tell you them dinosaurs were these big old creatures had these tiny little brains. As if to say they were so stupid they couldn't see their end coming. <laughs> I got a problem with that. <laughs> Don't you? Of course you do. I'll tell you that. That's right. You think the intelligence that made the oceans and the sky and the human eyeball? It makes something so stupid it couldn't see its end coming? <laughs> of course not. Yeah, and I agree with you on that. That's right. No, they weren't stupid. They were brilliant! Brilliant! You see the reason? The reason they had these tiny little brains was because they didn't need to waste any room up in their heads for storage of information. Not like us. No! <laughs> they had access to all of the information of the universe instantaneously. <laughs> That's right! And they did it with their superior powers of mental telepathy. Yeah. They did it telepathically! Yeah! It's kind of like a computer. You know, that thing that hold all the information on the internet, it couldn't do it. It just accesses it as it needs it, and that's what them dinosaurs did. They were brilliant! <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you something else. They saw their end coming, and they didn't just sit around and get all extinct about it either. Mm -mm. No, they saw their end coming, I'll tell you, and you know what they did? They changed. They attacked it. <laughs> Think about it. Them flatheads are going to tell you that the dinosaurs are extinct. They're going to tell you that, uh, you know, they, that the matter cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be changed. <laughs> that's what they do, they change. Now think about it. For something that's so extinct, they're everywhere. I mean, think of them everywhere. We got dinosaur theme parks, we got dinosaur movies, we got dinosaur, we got dinosaur television shows, we got a purple dinosaur sings, dancing, teaches our children. We got dinosaurs, <laughs> vitamin powers in the shape of a dinosaur. They're everywhere. I didn't know that, huh? <laughs> Mr. 
back of that course? I know that. But let me ask you something. Where do we get plastic from? <laughs> well, we're all plastic. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, it's a petroleum background. Where do we get petroleum from? Well, it's a fossil. <laughs> What are we going to say? Well, bro, it's a petroleum. It's a, it's a fossil fuel. I say fossil fuel. <laughs> <laughs> they just use fossils. You think they are? <laughs> They're living in 100% dinosaur. They're living in 100% dinosaur. <laughs> kind of makes you think, don't it? Yeah. You know, a few minutes ago, I believed in dinosaurs. Now you know enough to believe too. And then off he goes down the road. Heard his voice just about three minutes later, so his little boy's going, Hi, ah, my name's Merle. You believe in dinosaurs? Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, let's see. Oh, 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 oh. I read this story not long ago about a nine year old girl. She had to stay home whenever her mom went out running errands. But mom always got dressed up. She put on, uh, you know, makeup. She had earrings, jewelry. She put on a nice dress. But she always left her daughter at home with Miss Sitter or her relatives. Well, finally one day, the mother says to the daughter, "Would you like to run errands with me?" She thinks about errands. Oh my God! She runs upstairs. She puts on her best party dress. She puts on a pair of clip-on earrings. She does her hair. Well, she does try to put on her clip on her earrings. Let me see her. There we go. She does her hair up. She runs down to her mom. She brings a brush. Oh, mom, would you put some rouge on? Oh, she's so excited. Off they go. And after they've gone to the pharmacy, they've gone to the laundromat, they've gone to the post office, the little girl looks up at her mom. This is errands? <laughs> You know, I remember when I first started to go to parties. Well, this is partying? <laughs> no thanks. Yeah. Oh, this is what it is to be a success. I don't think so. This is what it is to be a man? Yeah. This is one of the most powerful things anyone has ever said to me in my life. It was early 90s. I was teaching here at Falmouth. And, uh, I was teaching creative problem solving to you know, kids in the schools. And uh, I was reading anything and everything that would expand my thinking and get me to think outside, you know, in just, oh, just so many ways. So I was constantly thinking from new perspectives. And I got to the point where I was thinking so far out there that I wrote a friend of mine, Doug. He had been the best man at my wedding. He'd run this college together. And we'd been in the way together. We'd both gotten out by this time. And, uh, Anyway, I wrote him. I said, I'm just I'm thinking so many thoughts from so many perspectives that I'm a little afraid I'm going to fall off the edge, you know. Ooh. Well, I forget about the letter. Several weeks pass, and I get this card in the mail. And all it says, well. <laughs> There's an edge. There's an edge? With three words, my reality expanded exponentially. What I thought of as the edge of reality, I realized was nothing more than the horizon of another possible reality, and another, and another, in any possible direction. To think three words from a friend could literally change my life. There's an edge. Sometimes, sometimes I find myself just standing in the middle of a room and I'm just standing there. You know, I'm not thinking about anything, I'm, I'm not looking for anything, but I, I'm just standing there. I, I don't know how much time has passed, but it does seem like a good deal of time has passed. I think I know how it kicks in, though. You know, I'm walking through the room and I, maybe I see my ukulele or, or this alien or, 
you know, for this rose. <coughs> what an amazing creation. To think that something as velvety soft and rich in color and texture and fragrance as a rose comes up out of the ground. You know, something as fragile as a rose is born of the earth. It just comes up, it grows, it becomes this fascinating thing of beauty. What is that thing in a rose that makes it a rose? How does it produce this seductive fragrance? I mean, it's just sitting in the dirt. So little seemingly to work with. I love roses. I always have. You know, when I was first married, I used to bring my wife a fresh cut rose every Friday night. It got to be where I could pick a perfect rose on Friday, be nice and a tight little bud. And then by when, uh, Sunday, it would have opened itself fully and filled the room with a seductive fragrance. <clears throat> Friday morning, it began to show faint signs of passing. But by Friday night, voila, a new rose. <laughs> well, I did this for years, until one day, I overheard my wife talking to a friend of hers. She referred to it as Chris's rose. Chris's rose? <laughs> Turns out she never liked roses. She never had. <laughs> I had been buying myself those roses all those years. <laughs> so I stopped bringing home roses after that. For the next 12 years of our marriage, there was never a fresh rose or a fresh cut flower of any kind in my house. You know, it's odd to me that it never occurred to her to buy me a rose every now and then. <laughs> of course, it didn't occur to me to buy one for myself either. <laughs> Until after the divorce. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it takes time to think about that. The next thing I know, I'm just standing in the middle of the room. I'm just standing there. Well, let's see what's up with the spinners. If you remember, they were so busy building these spinning machines. Well, one winter day, one of the spinners is sitting outside in the cold winter day, shivering as he looks up in the sky and the sun and thinks, boy, it would sure be nice if we could spring just a little sooner. <laughs> I bet a lot of you are thinking the same exact thing right now, right? But he knew it takes three months to get from winter to spring. Still, he thought about it. He thought, you know, the only thing that stands between winter and spring is the number of times that the Earth rotates around its axis as it revolves around the sun. <clears throat> what, if, what if we could spin the Earth a little faster? Could we get to spring just a little bit <laughs> Now, I know that's a silly notion, you know, it's a silly thing, but those kind of notions get in your head. Anyway, he didn't know what to do, so we're, you know, past as usual. Spring came. One late spring morning, he's walking out in this field, and it's covered with dew, and he sees these irises up ahead. And he goes up to the irises to look closer, and he finds on one of the petals this tiny, newly hatched spider, just a speck of a thing, size of a sesame seed, you know? And it's on top of a drop of dew. And it's just scurrying like this, trying to get over that drop of dew, but the dew is spinning underneath it. Oh, that's it, that's it, that's it! What if we were to run? We could maybe run and spin the earth just a little bit faster. We could get to spring just a little bit sooner. Of course, when he told people, they all laughed at him, right? But again, an idea like that gets in your head. Mm -hmm. So the next winter, why not? They started to run. And they found a great wide cave and they began to run. And they ran and they ran and they ran. And they ran. It was hard work, but they kept doing it. Eventually they took turns of course, and then finally it was to the point where somebody was always running, always running in their attempt to spin the earth a little faster to get to spring just a little sooner. Well, spring came. They did get here faster, I don't know. But the next winter, they started to run again. And they ran, and they ran, and the winter after that, and the winter after that, and the winter after that. Generations and generations of spinners came and went. And you know how it is when people start doing the same thing over and over. And spinning the earth just became a duty that one performed with that thought. As a matter of fact, pretty soon the spinners were spinning the earth 24 hours a day. 365 days a year because they had stories passed down from generation to generation. They had to spin the earth because if they didn't spin the earth, the earth wouldn't spin at all. 
Besides, if they were on the side of the earth that faced the sun, oh my god, they would fry. And if they were on the side of the earth that faced the moon, they would freeze. So they had to spin the earth. Because if they didn't spin the earth, they would fry or they would freeze. Heavy would do that. Besides, they were the spinners. That's why they were here, to spin the earth. Well, on and on and on it goes. Until one day, one of the chief scientists declared, This is nonsense. <laughs> We don't need to spin the earth. My God, what have we been thinking? We're clever people. Why don't we build a machine to spin the earth? <laughs> <laughs> and with that, bang, the people got on board with the idea of building a machine to spin the earth. We're going to leave them there for just a little bit while they uh, try to figure out how to build that machine. I was driving from Borum down to Scarborough. It's on Route 114. It's a two-lane road. And then the section I was in, it's mostly woods on either side. Occasionally there's a meadow, a driveway here and there. It's 35 miles an hour, so, you know, most cars are driving 40, 45. And I'm driving down the road, and I look in my rearview mirror, and I notice there's three or four cars behind me, about a tenth of a mile. When I look back up front, I see this dog come out from one of the driveways into the road. It's kind of like a pug or bulldog thing. He's kind of walking, you know, big chest like this, and, but it's got a little limp in the back of his leg. And uh, anyway, I think, boy, the dog doesn't see me, you know. And then I think, no, it turns and it faces me and looks right at me and starts walking like this right towards me. I'm thinking, whoa, and I'm so stunned that I almost run Butch down, you know? I mean, come on, what else would I call him? Butch. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily for Butch and for me, there's no cars in the other lane, so I go around Butch, and then I pull back in, and I slow down, and I look in my rearview mirror. I want to see what's going to happen next. And I figure Butch will cross the road now. Butch to the room. He just walks straight up to the cars behind him, just, just staring them down. Well, now traffic is coming in this lane. Luckily, those cars stop. And by that time, I can't see anything anymore. So that's the last I saw of Butch. But a couple of flash thoughts flashed through my mind. One, I don't think we're going to have Butch with us much longer. <laughs> I mean, it was awesome to see him stare those cars down. But come on, how lucky can he be, right? The next thing I thought about is, you know, what's the story here? I know my story, the one I just told you, but what has this dog walking out into the road and, you know, staring these cars down? Was he crazy or was he courageous? And then, believe it or not, the next thought I have is my senior year in high school. My family moved a lot. I went to, I lived in eight different states, 11 different schools before I got out of high school, four different uh, high schools, four different states. I was the new kid. I was tall, I was skinny, I wasn't into sports, and yes, I was skinny. <laughs> uh, I played the orchestra, I sang in the chorus. I was a prime target for bullies. And boy, within a couple weeks, I was on the daily hit list of Danny Street. Danny. He was the ultimate bad boy. You know, he just was incredibly fit. Blonde hair, blue eyes. While the rest of us were in college prep, he's over in auto shop repairing cars. He repaired, totally restored, a 1940s Plymouth to its original condition. It was gorgeous. He was gorgeous. But boy, he was a badass. He was just nothing but trouble. Oh, and what's more? <laughs> he had these two goons who hung out with him no matter where he went. I mean, it sounds like a movie, but it's true. They were always there. The first time I saw Danny and his goons, I thought, just stay away. And I figured, you know, what could possibly make my world and Danny's collide? Robin. <laughs> the first time Robin and I saw each other, we knew instantly we would be together. So I asked her out. I mean, I was new in town. How was I to know she just broke it up with Danny <laughs> <laughs> When word got out about our date, Danny and his thugs were in my face every single day. I'd, I'd be at my locker doing something, the hallways get quiet. I'd look, there'd be Danny and his thugs standing in the hallway. Always had this special light behind him, casting this shadow. <laughs> I don't know if he knew it and did it intentionally, or if it, the fear in my own mind put it there, I don't know. Anyway, he'd say something like, hey, new kid! I was used to that. Next time I see you alone, you're dead! And then he'd turn and he'd strut away with his boys. 
He just did this daily, always harassed me. I'd be walking around, boss, he shoulder bumped me into some other kids saying something nasty. They would just harass me day after day after day. And I was just getting really tired of it. So it's a Saturday night. A couple carloads of us have got, driven up this windy mountain road. It's very icy. And we've gone to this clearing up at top. And we're going to just sit there and drink some beer and just be kids being stupid, right? So Rob and I are in the back of Opal's car. Opal and his girlfriend, Denise, are in the front seat. And uh, there's another car, you know, another car next to us. And we see these lights of a car coming up. It's Van Eek Street. He pulls in next to us in his beautifully restored car. He rolls his window down to talk to Denise and Opal. Rob and I try to be invisible in the back. And everything's going fine until he suddenly he sees Robin. Where's Newcomb? And then Opal starts his car, backs out, whoop, down this mountain. We're just going down this icy road slide. Oh, it was frightening. It's called get up. But we can see Danny's lights chasing us down the road. Well, Opal's a good driver. We get out on the main road, and we head into town. Danny stops chasing us. We figure he's done. He's had his fun. He must go back up you know, to the top of the mountain to drink with the other guys. We go into town on Spring Street, and we go to the little pizza shop. There's a couple of kids there already, so we're just sitting around a table, you know, talking, being stupid. And a little while passes, and the door bursts open. And in steps Danny Street. He has a cut on his cheek. His clothes are disheveled. He takes one step in, looks down, nuke him! Outside! Now! All oh, the place, all the eyes are on him, it's silent. He turns, and when he walks away, he has a visible limp. Now all eyes are on me. And they're all saying, stay here, just stay inside. You know, but I can't, I've done, I've had it with this guy. I'm just done, I never want to have to deal with this creep again. And so I head out the door. And friends are not, they got to come out and see the spectacle of me getting beaten out. So, how we going? I know, I know I'm going to have the crap beat out of me. Come on, I can, there's no way that I can win a fight with Danny Street. But I'm done. I've had it. So, I walk out to the street, and there's Danny and his thugs standing in the road about 20, 25 feet away. Special lighting. I'm serious. He had a street light behind him. And there is a huge shadow coming down the road. I look at him. He doesn't move. He's just looking tough and hot at the same time. So finally, he mumbles something. He had rolled his 1940s Plymouth as he came down the mountain chasing me. Oh, he was furious. I was dead. But he didn't move. He just stood there in the same stance he always had. The school just so threatening. I took a couple of steps toward him. I could see this flash shot. He would go across his eyes. But he didn't move. I took a couple more steps. He just stood there. I finally walked right up to him. I was three or four feet from him. I looked him right in the eye. He looks at me. He looks at the kids who are gathered on the street. He looks back at his thugs. He looks back at me. No. If I wouldn't, if I wouldn't hurt so bad, I'd make the living crap out of you. <laughs> you just wait. You're history, Newcomb. And then he turned and he limped away with his thumbs. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. How in the hell was I not having the living crap beat out of me? All I'd done was walk up to him and face him head on. And he had turned and walked away. And you know the most amazing part of the story. He never bothered me again, ever. <laughs> you know? And ever since then, I think about that when life tries to threaten me, whether it's a person or a situation tries to make me feel less than or miserable or something. I just always try to walk right up to it, face it head on. And so far, just like Danny Street, the bad boy of Mount Greylock Regional High School, <laughs> they have always bad. Butch, remember Butch? <laughs> what was his story? Was he crazy or was he courageous? I don't know. But I'll tell you the story that I think. The story I tell myself is that something happened to Butch that made him tired of running from cars. And so now he walks out into the road and he just faces them down. <laughs> you know, most times he does it probably to get to the other side, get to the meadow on the other side of the road. Sometimes he does it just because he can. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
oh, oh, oh. All right, now this, I mean, my kids are going to think, what in the hell is this? This will really baffle them if I don't explain it. I keep an old milk cart right now, right? So I was getting gas at a convenience store. And it's one of those big glassed-in buildings, you know? I got the gas and I went in to pay for the gas. And when I opened the door, ooh, the smell of spoiled milk was awful. It was rancid. So as I went up to the cashier, I thought, you know, normally I wouldn't say anything, but it smelled so bad, I thought I wanted to at least let them know I, you know, I understood. So I said, hey, man, sorry, it stinks in here. Mm -hmm. Huh? I said, the sour milk. What? I don't smell anything. And then I realized he'd been in that glass in room for so long, he had no idea how bad it smelled. I mean, all he'd have to do is take one step outside, take a breath of fresh air, walk in, and woo, <laughs> he would know instantly, right? Well, we can't change the things we don't know about. Maybe we need to step outside of the glassed-in booths and glassed-in worlds that we live in every now and then, take a breath, you know, breath of fresh air, step back in, and see if our thinking is a sour. You know, it's kind of like the spinners. Let's see if they can step outside of this story they've been telling themselves for so long that they are responsible for the spinning of the earth. Well, as we left them, they were going to build this gigantic machine to spin the earth. The first thing they did was they dug a huge trench so they could sink gigantic wheels and massive gears into the earth. Of course, to have those wheels and those gears, they had to build more machines, special machines, to make the wheels and make the gears and make the pulleys and the chains and all the things. And each machine made more and more smoke that went up into the air. The sky was getting so full with smoke from all their machines, you could barely see the sky. <sighs> They were all making so much noise, you could barely hear anything. But it was time, finally, to start the machine that was spinning the earth for them. So the spinners gathered around, and the workmen started the fires to make the steam to, you know, start the machines. And they began to growl, and to groan, and to hiss, and to moan, and clack, and oh, this noise was so loud, they could barely hear themselves think, and the cloud and the smoke went up so, they could barely see the sky, and they wondered, how will we know if it's working? Patch of sky that opened, and there was the sun low on the horizon. But time passed, the machine coughed up more smoke and more noise, and finally, a little later, there's another hole. There was a sun higher in the sky than it was before. We did it! My God! It was just amazing! We built a machine that spins the earth for us! And it came that night. The moon came up. Oh, it was hard to see, but every now and then they could see the moon rising. They were so proud. Oh, how about that? They had a celebration to honor their cleverness for building this machine that would spin the earth. They sang, danced. Yeah, they, they drank just too much wine. <laughs> you know, my God, we're amazing! We have built a machine that spins the earth. <laughs> you know, now we can get on living the life we've always wanted to live. But we've been too busy to spin the, you know, trying to spin the earth and, uh, well, you know, they had no idea what they wanted to do. They've been too busy spinning the earth for so long. And besides, their scientists thought, you know, if one machine can spin the earth for us, lots of machines can make it easier. And so in no time, they were building more and more machines in every corner, every village, every hammock, sending up smoke, making noise. It was just so furious, but the people, they couldn't really hear all that noise or see the smoke because they were too busy maintaining, expanding, repairing the machines. And so over time, everyone began to work for the machine. But they had to work for the machine because the machine spun the earth for them. They had to spin the earth because the earth, you know, I mean, they wouldn't spin without them. And if they didn't do it, they would fry or they would freeze, and everybody knew that. <laughs> So on and on and on they go, these machines sending more and more smoke into the air. And just as it was so hard through that smoke to see the sky, so it's difficult to see through the fog of history exactly what happened to the spinners. Oh, we could assume that there's so much, so many clouds, so much smog, that the light just barely could get into them. The plants finally began to die. The people eventually died. And all we have left is this tale and the many bits and pieces of all their spinning machines, which you know, slowly deteriorate into the iron ore that we have in the earth beneath our feet. 
Now, some people say it was a cleverness that didn't mend it. Others say, oh, no, 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 it was a faulty science. <laughs> I don't think it's either one of those. It's not their cleverness or their faulty science. I think the problem was they told themselves for so long that they were the spinners, that they'd forgotten who they really were. They weren't the spinners. They were the people of the sky. Perhaps we are as well. Believe it or not, Robin and I stayed with the way for another seven years after that night that I kicked me and Maria out into the cold, cold dark night. We were involved with the way for a total of 17 years. And in that time, we were never part of mainstream society, the world as we called it. You know, we had jobs, you know, we paid our bills, we ran errands. But we weren't of the world. The world was a dark, evil place. Our world, full of joy, peace, love, it was great. Uh, you know, for 20 years, we didn't listen to your books or your movies or any of that. We didn't read your books. We didn't watch your news. We didn't watch your movies. We didn't have to. We had our own movies. We had our own entertainment. We had our own books. We had our own sources of information. Mm -hmm. But finally, you know, over time, the way, which like most systems, started out serving people, eventually morphed to where people were serving the system. And at that point, I knew it was time to get out. And Robin was ready as well. And bang, just like that, we were tossed from this total control and shelter of this world that had all of the answers out into the wide open, you know, nothingness of mainstream society. I had gone right back to 1971 as if I'd gone right through a time warp. I remember, I looked at Robin. Who, who are we? Our entire marriage had been based on the teachings of the framework of the Way International. Were we lovers? Were we even friends? What do we do now? We didn't know. We didn't have the answers. The only thing we did know is we needed to start over. And unbelievably, my company that I worked for offered me a position up in Bangalore, two hours north. And so I took it, and we moved up to Oregon. So over the next few years, we both started seeing therapists. We went to group therapy, and we drifted apart. I mean, the only thing holding us together were our four children. We knew we should separate, but we both come from families of divorce. It was never going to happen to us, right? Well, one day, I'm seeing my therapist. He was a graduate student at UMO. And he asked me to rate myself. Where would I rate myself, he said, on the Kinsey scale? Well, he explained, the Kinsey scale goes from zero, representing heterosexual, to ten, representing homosexual. Where would I rate myself? I, I, I just stared at him. I, I couldn't say a thing. I, I was dumbfounded. I was like a deer in a headlight. The mere question itself was stirring up so many thoughts and feelings inside. He went on to explain that of thousands of people surveyed, the vast majority rated themselves somewhere between a four and a seven. What? What? I, I didn't really know what to do with this until I got home. You see, when I was a kid, I was attracted to boys. I always was. I had had intimate experiences with other boys over long periods of time, and I really liked it. But I remember being called queer, and how awful that felt. And so I stuffed it, you know. Besides, everyone said it was wrong. But you know, after that, every time I'd see a hot-looking guy, and my groin would burn with desire, buzz with desire, I just say, oh, no, 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 he's a good-looking guy. He can have any girl he wants. I'm just jealous of him. <laughs> well, meanwhile, in my art studio, I'm beginning to make these figures, and the figures have both male and female genitalia. Now, something is clearly going on, but I can't figure it out. Until we're closing group therapy one night, and we're doing the serenity prayer. And we come to the point of, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And I think to myself, rather flippantly, well, what can I change? And this voice, clear as a bell, you're gay. Just like that, that clear, you're gay. I can still hear it 31 years later, almost to this day. I just sat there and went, well, duh. <laughs> what have I been thinking? I go home, 
I tell Robin, I mean, at this point in our life, our communication is nothing more than the business of running a household with four children. Our sex life, nil. She is amazingly receptive and, and accepting of my revelation. And we begin to make plans for what to do next. The next morning, I'm driving to school. I'm driving by the UMO campus, and there's this hot-looking guy driving down the road. And for the first time in my life, I thought to myself, I'm not jealous of him. I want that. <laughs> Let me tell you, it was so freeing. So freeing to admit that I had these desires, and they were natural desires that I shoved down deep for 25 years. So, by May, I moved out. You know, we were starting our life over. It was hard. Both of us cried. We had a lot of tears during those weeks and months. But you know, I mean, come on, we built a life together. We had four kids. But eventually we stumbled along and we found our way. Not the way. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I was wrong <coughs> to deny my sexuality all those years. But here's something I've had to reconcile. What about my kids? If I had to come out when I was young, forget that. I wouldn't give up my kids or my grandkids for anything. I wouldn't even give up my time with Robin or our time in the way because all of those things are my stories. That's what brought me here today. And it's those stories. <sighs> I need to tell my kids. <laughs> so that now I make you think they might give up. A lot of stuff. I, uh, I'm beat. <laughs> I'm too tired to finish this tonight. I'm gonna, I think I'll finish this tomorrow. Thank you for listening. Thank you.